I want to thank you all for being here. And I would like to just uh, point out some of the key staff of the MGA. Um, but before I do that, I'd like to just point out, is there any MGA uh, board members here? If you can just raise your hand. Great, thank you. Um, staff, uh, in the back there we have Ron Duncan from SoCal Creek. We have uh, John Ricker, I saw him come in, from the city of Santa Cruz, uh, the county of Santa Cruz. Um, Am I missing anyone? We got Tim Carson and Darcy Pruitt uh, from the Regional Water Management Foundation, uh, Sierra, um, and myself. Well, I'm Ralph Brockamani with Central Water District. Thank you, Marco. Uh, so thank you all for being here. Um, do we have anybody from the advisory group? Great, thank you. Uh, private wells. Any private well users here? We got a couple. Same hands going up on a few of these. Uh, anybody from a municipality or a central water district or one of the water districts? Raise your hand. Got a few of those. Am I missing anybody? All right. Well, welcome. Uh, with that, um, tonight is going to be really exciting. We're going to hear a little bit about the model, and I would like to introduce to you uh, introduce to you Ellen Cross, who's from Kennedy. Uh, Kearns and West, Kearns and West. Ellen? Thank you and welcome um, to the fourth public orientation meeting. Really appreciate you being here. I'm the newbie probably in the crowd here and I'll be facilitating you um, tonight. Uh, am I running the PowerPoint, Tim? Do I have a... You have Yes. Okay, I'll power it up. Thank you. So, um... Today, uh, you should have gotten an agenda at the front. And uh, so today's workshop, basically, will be for us to be facilitating the groundwater modeling session. And um, I want to note that we will be recording this meeting. So we have a microphone right up here in front. It's a very accurate microphone. So just be aware if you're having little side conversations, you may be picked up on the microphone. And this is going to be videoed and put on the website. So it is definitely an incentive for not talking unless it's your turn to talk or keeping it very quiet because it may pick up some of the sound um, from your conversation. And again, we'll be recording this and it will be on the website for the public and everyone to view. Um, I'm just gonna go through a few uh, guidelines before we get started with the agenda. We're going to have four presentations, essentially, four sections of a presentation on modeling. And we're going to take a break after each phase of the presentation because there's a lot of information that we're going to be bombarding you with and we're going to give you a chance at four different intervals to ask questions. So I'll be asking Cameron um, Todd at a pause so you have a chance to get a card, ask your questions. We'll be asking you to turn your questions into Darcy and Sierra. And then I'll be reading the questions. And we're doing that really for two reasons. We're doing it because we are recording this and it's just easier for the microphone to pick up the questions. And it's also in order for us to manage the time. Because again, you're going to get a lot of information tonight. And we really want to make time for everyone to get their questions um, answered. Um, also on this will be that uh, if you have any questions or a follow-up question, the question you answered, we'll, we'll allow you to do a follow-up question. We're not going to ask you to write that back out again. So um, the workshop objectives for today are going to be providing introduction to groundwater models. So Cameron um, Tommy, who I'll be introducing in a second, will be going through that. He's going to describe how the ground models will be used for the groundwater sustainability plan. Also, we'll be describing the model of the Mid-County Basin, as well as outlining plans for simulating future groundwater management in the Mid-County Basin. So, um, you're going to get a full-on presentation uh, today on that. And then, our agenda, after the presentation of questions, we'll have some closing remarks on what the next steps are in the process <coughs> of the groundwater sustainability. Um, planning process. We do have very few ground rules and the ground rules are put in place just so everyone has an opportunity um, to ask questions and to get a better understanding of groundwater monitoring. So we like very active and full participation. We want to encourage that. So please don't be shy. 
and make sure you catch our attention. If you didn't get a question card or if we missed your question somehow, we want to make sure you have that opportunity. We want to be respectful of all interactions in the room. Um, groundwater modeling tends to be a topic that people might have different opinions about how things might be done. We want to be able to listen and capture all those ideas. So again, just being respectful of different ideas in the room and with each other. We're going to honor the agenda. You guys took time out of your busy schedules. We have from 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock tonight. We're really going to try to end this promptly at 9 o'clock. Um, again, I already talked about the speaker cards. We'll be distributing those throughout four different times through the presentation and give you an opportunity to write questions and, and answers at diff four different phases. Now, if I can just ask about electronics, if you can all turn your phones to silent or vibrate so it doesn't disrupt the presentation and it also doesn't disrupt the um, recording, that would be really helpful. Okay, so we just went through this, so we're going to adjourn at 9, the ground rules, sorry guys. And now I'm going to introduce you to um, Cameron Tonham with Hydrometrics. He is running the groundwater modeling program for the groundwater sustainability plan. And with no further ado, he's been working in this basin, by the way, for over a decade. So you're getting a professional that really knows this basin well. I'm sure he's really going to welcome any of your questions. So with that. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me OK. Uh, we do have. The microphone, but it's a smaller room this time, or less wide room. So hopefully everybody can hear me, but we can move the mic if you are having trouble hearing me. And I really appreciate the uh, introduction from Ellen, and then also Ralph reminding uh, all of us of our previous orientation sessions, because those orientation sessions really set up well uh, what I'm talking about today with the modeling, because all those concepts uh, we will be using for the model and so you'll see some familiar slides and hopefully that you'll remember some of the fundamentals that Derek Williams talked about, some of the information about the basin that I talked about, the ideas behind sustainability that Derek came back and talked about and how we use the model to bring those things together. So Ellen went over the objectives, um, the outline of different sections of my talk. The, the first part is to get at that, the first two objectives. Um, and then the next two parts are talking a little more detailed about what the model that we're, we've developed for the Mid-County Basin is doing. And then lastly, specifically what the plans are for using that model in the, for the Mid-County Basin for the groundwater sustainability plan, as well as other uh, water resources projects in, in the basin. So to introduce groundwater modeling, try to, to build up from the basics and just to describe what does a groundwater flow model do. And a model takes inputs that we have information about, such as climate, a rainfall, uh, temperatures, also information about the use and management of water. So that can be basically groundwater pumping extractions, uh, surface water use, also management like manage recharge projects. Take those inputs and then provide information about how that affects the groundwater base and what, what kind of outputs are we talking about for, for describing the effects of the groundwater basin? They include groundwater levels, how high or low our ground, is groundwater. What are the flows in the groundwater basin? What are the different, how are the flows to streams affected? How is flows offshore or coming from offshore affected? Uh, so these are the kinds of outputs that a model provides. You can also track groundwater, if you put water in the ground or take water out, where is it coming from, where is it, or where is it going? These are the basic outputs that a model can provide. Why, why do we use models for planning? Now, that a very uh, often used and often appropriate 
way to manage groundwater is to use adaptive management, where you observe what happens and change course based off of actual results. And uh, that can definitely be used uh, to manage a basin. But sometimes you need more than that because you want to see what will happen that hasn't occurred yet. You have an issue that you might need changes to the way you manage the basin that hasn't happened yet. You really want an idea of what will happen if you make these changes. So you change, so as a result, you, you use a model by changing the inputs of the model, which can include management and use of the model, change in usage of, of water supplies in the basins that hasn't occurred before, or you want to manage the basin differently, you want to see the effects of that on the groundwater basin. This is what a model can help you do. Another possible change you may not have as much control over, that includes climate. Expect maybe a change in climate that hasn't occurred before. You want to see the results of in the groundwater basin or on the groundwater uh, because of that. And so you get the same kind of output, but this time they're output that represent projections as a result of these, these changes that you want to see what the effects are. So if you change management or if climate changes, what happens to groundwater levels, what happens to flows, what happens to where groundwater travels. And those projections can help you inform your plan. You use those results and say, okay, well that plan, we, we changed these inputs and it didn't achieve what we wanted to do. It didn't achieve sustainability, if you're looking at a groundwater sustainability plan. So maybe that plan isn't such a good idea. But this plan does seem to work. So let's explore that one uh, further. So that's how model output helps you inform uh, plans. So what, what does a model do to take those inputs and give you the outputs? And it really just does what Derek described in, his very, in the very first orientation session groundwater 101. The model is, is just is calculating water changes. It's calculating, it's just applying this inflow minus outflow is a change, results in a change of storage. And a change of storage is really represented by the change in groundwater levels. So that's how we get our outputs. We more or less put this, these as inputs and this get, becomes an output. And so that's all, that's all the model is, is doing, uh, but it's doing it many, many times and uh, all at the same time. So why do we model with a computer? And, and, th and this is a very simple concept, this water budget, but one reason we want to model with a computer is that there's inflows and outflows, but there are actually many inflows and outflows to track. Derek described some of the inflows that are, that are uh, that could occur and some of the outflows that occur. And, and there are many of them, so we need a way to track them. The computer helps us with that. And also some flows are interdependent. Because some flows affect other flows. So uh, those relationships are not something that you can do with uh, a pad and paper, and very difficult even to do with, with say, a spreadsheet. And so it's also, and some of these flows are also difficult and complex to estimate accurately, so you need a way to estimate some of these, these inputs, and that becomes part of your, your model too. Another reason why I model a computer is that water, groundwater uh, flows uh, following laws of physics, and models can represent those laws of physics uh, with equations, and basically the laws of physics that provide the water flows from high to low elevations. But representing those laws of physics uh, is something uh, a model and a computer can do. And as a result, uh, a kind of model, there are different kinds of models, but something called a numerical model, uh, where calculations are done by a computer, are often used for a basin-wide model, when you're trying to model something like the Santa Cruz Mid County Basin. And so it's covering a large area, uh, as I talked about in the state of basin presentation, orientation session, of a stacked aquifer units, so you have multiple aquifers, so it's three-dimensional. And large area, uh, multiple aquifers, you end up with many equations that need to be solved and calculated. And this is why uh, we use a computer to, to model uh, the groundwater basin. What kind of equations are, is the, the groundwater model solved? It's the same 
uh, equations that Derek introduced in, in Groundwater 101, uh, like Darcy's Law. Basically, how does the water flow from high groundwater levels to low groundwater levels? It's dependent on hydraulic conductivity, which says something about the sediments that the water is flowing through underground. The hydraulic gradient is what are the, what, how high of a water level is it flowing from to the, the low water levels. Um, what is the area? How, how thick is your aquifer that it's flowing through? And so this is the, one of the equations that, is, uh, that a groundwater model solves. Um, and it's solving it for three-dimensional flow, both horizontally, where flow is usually, um, where the sediment is usually allowed, is more conducive to flow, and vertically, which is usually less conducive to flow. But because you have these stacked aquifer units, you want to solve flows in all three, three dimensions. Flow equations include storage properties. They're described as about how much water can be released from the pores of an aquifer. But storage in our groundwater flow equations are basically describing how groundwater levels change over time. So not only do we have, we're trying to represent a large area, uh, multiple aquifer units with depth, but also how things change over time. So a, a fourth dimension <coughs> there. How does, how does numerical model represent space and time? Well, it basically divides up our big area uh, for space into many little pieces. And it does that with a grid or a mesh. I'm gonna to refer to grid cells because that's what we end up using for the Santa Cruz Mid-County Basin. But it divide, the, the model divides it up into many different cells. And the calculations are done at each cell. So it's just simply the same water budget calculation and then flow equations between adjacent cells. So you have all these cells a lot of equations that need to be solved um, with the help of a computer. So we divide it up into these different pieces, these different cells for helping us uh, model the, the groundwater basin. Um, but we can't divide it, we want to divide it small enough so we can answer the questions at the, the scale we have questions about near, say near wells and, and things like that at the coast. But we don't want to divide it too small because then it takes very long time to, to, to make all these calculations. This uh, discretization in space does allow us to include lateral variability, which Derek talked about in Groundwater 101. Because each model cell can have different properties for hydraulic conductivity and storage for <coughs> calculating those, those equations. did introduce the idea that the basin, uh, Santa Cruz Mid-County Basin, has stacked aquifer units. And this is where the model allows us to model the, the vertical flow, the three-dimensional flow, by representing aquifers and aquitards as layers. So each of these layers at each of these cells uh, um, is cells stacked on top of each other where the model can calculate the flows uh, up and down the, between the cells. <coughs> Time also uh, needs to be discretized or divided up. There are a couple of different concepts for time where uh, one is time step, where calculations are done at each time step. Uh, in the mid-county basin, it, it, it's a daily time step in the model we've developed. But also inputs can be provided over multiple time sets, those are referred to as stress periods, where we provide averages or totals and generally provide that monthly by the mid-county basin model. So how, how do we assess whether the model is representing reality? And we use calibration to do that. And this is going back to the same concept of what the inputs are and what the outputs are from the model. But then what do we do to adjust the model so that uh, it, the outputs represent reality? So typically what we do is we take the historical data for an input, so historical climate, information about temperature and uh, rainfall, 
and, and historical usage in management. So historical pumping, um, surface water extractions, if there are any uh, things that are provided to manage, recharge the basin. We provide that as the input to the model, and we get output from the model. When you first do that, the output, it doesn't represent the output. You can, we do, because we're, and how do we assess that? We compare it to the historical observations um, that have been observed. So we're comparing the output to the historical observations. Then we adjust the properties of the model that, that are used in the equations about the sediments for the aquifers, the hydraulic content in storage, such that the model inputs approximate historical observations. And that's how we assess how the models represent the reality. And that calibration process provides a level of confidence when we are using the model for evaluating the future changes for our plan, and how the future changes result in model projections that are meant to inform our plan. But not only does the calibration provide confidence, we can also evaluate uncertainty within the calibration. And with that, not just say these are the results we're getting from the model, but this is a measure of uncertainty of the results we're getting from the model. And policymakers can use both the results, the projections, and the uncertainty to help inform the, their plans. So, if anyone has a question, could you please raise your hand and Sarah and Darcy are going to pass you a question and answer card. So we have one over here. Any others? Questions? Another one over here? Right here, Sarah. Great. Any others? Yeah, over here. So in a few more slides, um, Sarah and Darcy are going to be collecting these back, and then we will have questions for our camera. Thank you. So that is my introduction to groundwater modeling. Um, and now we'll shift a little bit to how models are used for groundwater sustainability plans. So hopefully it gives enough of an idea that we can, to, we can discuss how, how a model would be used specifically in the context of, of signal. And I think this was the first orientation session uh, where Sigma was introduced, uh, where uh, Derek described the five different parts in the GSP outline. And a model actually could be used in three of the parts, as far as I, I could tell. Um, and the three parts, three middle parts, include describing the basin geology and hydrogeology, the, the sustainability management criteria, which is in part three, and identifying the programs and projects. What's the plan to, to get you to sustainability? And so for the first of those uh, three parts, um, part two is, is where a model can be used to provide information about groundwater budgets that are required in this part of the groundwater sustainability plan. So the groundwater budgets include both the historical and current budgets, so you would use a calibrated model to say, what are those, what are those flows between uh, the land surface and groundwater and land surface stream, and what we've included in the model for the pumping, um, and all the different flows that need to be provided as information about what, what the basin, what the conditions in the basin are like. And did these, this budget can be estimated without a model, but the model helps us bring all these uh, these flows together, make sure they're consistent with each other, consistent with what we know about physically, about how groundwater flows, and that it's calibrated to uh, historical groundwater levels um, or other information. And we, we can provide that budget from a calibrated model. Also, uh, part two uh, asks for information about future groundwater budget. And again, the model can be due can help with that, and because, especially because this is information we have not observed, and we are we need to project that groundwater budget. This is where having the model is necessary, um, and we, it also requires including the effects of climate change, and because the, one of the inputs to the model is climate information, that we can include uh, the effects of climate change by using the model to provide groundwater budget information. 
One thing that is required in part two is an estimate of sustainable yield, and the model can help estimate that, but it does require, require making decisions that are included in part three, making decisions about sustainable management criteria. What, how do the users of the space and how does the New County Groundwater Agency, with the advice of the advisory committee, define sustainability for the basin? I want you to do that, use the model to say, what is the yield, what does the budget look like to make sure you're sustainable? And that helps you estimate sustainable yield. So this is part two of the GSP that, uh, where, where groundwater budgets can be used for the model. Part three, the sustainable management criteria, decisions for, for that. Now, as I mentioned, this, and Derek probably talked about a lot at the last session, is how this, these are policies that need to be decided on by the MGA, advised by the advisory committee, um, input from all stakeholders, is how do you define sustainability for the basin? And so, for the most part, that's probably going to be independent of the model, specifically, what, is an undesir what are undesirable results for our six uh, sustainability indicators? What are the minimum thresholds that, that define that undesirable results? Most likely, pretty these are policy decisions uh, independent of the model. But there could be some information from the model that will be used, but still mostly policy independent of the model. But once you set that, the model can be used to help with additional sustainable management criteria that are required. And they include uh, the measurable objections. And this is not, not a sure thing about the model being necessary, but I do see a use for it. Uh, because the measurable objectives need to be defined by operational flexibility above the minimum thresholds. And so, how do you define the operational flexibility? Well, the operational flexibility is probably going to depend on how you plan to operate the basin. What, what are the plans and projects you're going to implement? And how, what is, what is the, the flexibility that's going to be required when you implement those plans? To see those effects, you probably need a you know, model to do that. Um, so that's, that's this is from, this figure here is from the recently released draft best management practice for sustainable management criteria by the California Department of Water Resources. I don't know if it was out, I think it was just out when Derek spoke to you. Um, this figure kind of shows the relationship between the sustainable management criteria. And as you can see, measurable objective is above the minimum threshold based off operational flexibility. And I think a model could help define operational flexibility based off of the plans and projects to choose. Um, even more confident that a model will be useful for interim milestones. So the interim milestones are basically, what, how do you know you're on track to get to sustainability from 2020 to 2040? And this change over time, how, how, do you see, how do you stay on track? That is something a model can, can help you with the perspective. Here are the projects and plans to help us get to the measurable objective, and then what is what is the projected uh, trajectory of getting there? And the model provide that information. So part four, demonstrating the plan to achieve sustainability, you probably would actually do this before getting to the measurable objectives and internal milestones. But how do you show DWR that you've made, you define, once you've defined sustainability, um, that you are going to achieve it and maintain, achieve it by 2040, this is a critically overdrafted basin, and maintain it uh, for 30 years afterwards as required by, by Sigma to grow in sustainable tent regulations. So the way you're going to show it is probably by projecting, showing projected results from a groundwater model. So you put the projects and programs that you decide on as inputs and then show that it achieves your definition of sustainability within 20 years and maintains it. Another thing that a model could be used for as part of this part is uh, benefits for different users of the basin for different projects and programs or, or plans. And so that's something that uh, the county's grant uh, from the, the state is designed to, to address. The, the request is grant funding to use the model to evaluate what are the effects of different uh, kinds of pumpers on 
uh, conditions in the basin that gets at this idea of who proving. Maybe one second, Carol. So did everyone pass their cards to Darcy and to Sierra? And anyone need a card, Q&A card? Thank you. So DWR, uh, most of that is, is really my reading of what is required in the GSG. And, and there's some information in the regulations about where a model would be required. Uh, DWR is explicit about using models for GSP in a couple of places. And they are in the regulations. They do specify, set uh, numerical groundwater and surface water models as the standard uh, tool to evaluate projected water budget conditions. So that's the part two of the GSP. They provide information on what a model needs to have. The documentation needs to be publicly available. It needs to be calibrated to uh, observations um, for the basin. It also, uh, based, they did allow for previously constructed models to not be open source, but newly constructed models needed to be public open source software. And a year ago, they released best management practices for, for modeling. Uh, the selection of a modeling platform for the Mid-County Basin came out before uh, this guidance for the DWR came out, but uh, the selection does meet the, the guidance. And it is, and so for, for the Mid-County Basin, um, the MGA, its members, and its previous incarnations uh, decided on GS Flow, which is an integrated groundwater surface water model. So it meets that idea of that kind of model being that standard for evaluation. Um, creating water budgets. It was developed by the US Geological Survey, so it's public document, publicly doc, public documentation, it's public domain code. It is listed in the BMP as commonly used in California. It's specifically listed as a model that's been used to evaluate the sustainability indicators of lowering groundwater levels, reduction of storage, and surface water depletion. It didn't specifically indicate seawater intrusion, um, but one, you can evaluate sea water intrusion if you set your, uh, your sustainable management criteria as using groundwater levels as a proxy for sea water intrusion, and um, which, is, which is one of the reasons why to use a proxy. It's, it's easier to manage the groundwater levels with either by observations or, or with the model. But also, um, the MGA funded adding a sea water intrusion package to GPS flow to help evaluate seawater intrusion. Uh, the DWR did a survey about different models and different basins throughout the state. Uh, we shared information about the model that the MGA is developing for the Mid-County Basin and they were provided that they liked the idea that we would model both the watershed and, and the groundwater aquifers. Now, because you are doing an integrated groundwater surface water model, it is, it is a, a more complex model and that does leads to calibration challenges. Uh, so we have been uh, working on that for a decent amount of time. Um, now in developing the model, other models in the area did inform uh, the development of the model. There was a groundwater model for Central Water District uh, to help with the Romus area structure. Uh, Pajaro Valley has a model that, come, that overlaps with the Mid County Basin. So this uh, western part of the screen line is the western boundary of the Pajaro Valley model. Uh, used information of crop coefficients from, from that, that model. Um, Santa Margarita Basin model, uh, over here in the northwest, northwest adjacent model, also uh, doesn't overlap much into our purple basin area, but it is adjacent and did help us define uh, how uh, the, the subsurface structure should look like because the Mid County Basin represents the whole, the Mid County Basin model represents the whole watershed that does go into the Santa Margarita Basin a little bit. And previously, uh, Stokoe Creek Water District did a recharge study for the basin area using the same watershed model that we were using uh, in, this, in this GS format. So that helped with some initial setup. 
So uh, now we can take those questions uh, on, on this model introduction. And if uh, you have any questions on the latter part, uh, please let us know if you want to card. Okay, Cameron, um, we're basically going to reach out to Cameron and then to the executive and advisory committee and others who want to add on to anything Cameron might have said to the question. So the first question, I don't have the um, person who asked a question, but the question is, does the calibration change in time? That is, how do we know that our model will be appropriate for the future? Well, it is uh, a tough question, but there are, I, there, uh, calibration can change over time when you get new information. And, and when you get new information, you do want to, you do want to evaluate, recalibrate it to make sure that the model is reflecting the best information you have. And the but the model as is, is calibrated the information you do have. And so it's really, you're really trying to do the best you can do at the time. And so that's, that's what the calibration is meant to do. But they, like they're calibrating to incomplete information. And so when you do get new information, there may be a, a need to recalibrate. But they're trying to take the best information you have at the time and use that information to project what um, what groundwater what the groundwater looks like going forward. Any follow-up question to that? Thank you. So this question is from David Baskin. How does our model manage inputs from other models? For example, climate change models where there are numerous modeling scenarios we need to consider as possible features. Yes, uh, I'll go into uh, power handling climate change. Uh, towards the end of the presentation. Um, and so, the, the one, one thing is that, that something like that is going to require choices. Uh, you know, what, what do you want, what, what makes sense to choose as an input for, for the model? What climate change model do we want to use as an input? What, what represents uh, possible conditions we want to plan to? So, those, those are choices that uh, haven't necessarily been completely made yet. Uh, we've made some choices for modeling groundwater uh, climate change, but one thing that we're doing right now is evaluating whether we need to make another choice. So I'll get into that later. Um, David Baskin's follow-up question. How do the differences in modeling and the various models used to confirm our model impact the margin of error? That. How do the differences in modeling and the various model used to confirm our model impact the margin of error? And feel free to ask David for clarification. That was actually to inform our model. Okay, sorry about that, to inform. So, how do the difference in modeling and the various models used to inform our model impact the margin of error? Uh, um, they can impact the, the uncertainty of the model results. Uh, substan substantially. And so uh, the, the key is to try to use the model as best we can to try to, to quantify that uncertainty. And the way we're planning on doing it is looking at how, uh, how model results change if, if you have a similar, um, if, you, your, if your model results, the calibration output is, is matching the observation similarly. What is the range of possible outcomes within that? And so uh, that's, that's the way we're planning on doing it. Another way you can do it is if you have more uncertainty about specific inputs, what is the sensitivity of changing those inputs? How does that change the output? So those, those are a couple of ways we can, we can address that. So there are, there are definitely part inputs that are we know better than others. There's some that there's, there's data for the inputs for the most part. Uh, municipal agency pumping, we have pretty good data on that, but there's some other parts we don't have good data that we're estimating. And so one way to test the effect of those estimates is to, to see what the sensitivity of changing those estimates are on the results, that the calibrated results. Um, okay, question from John Kennedy. How do we reduce the risk of Sustainability plan. For example, if we look at groundwater levels relative to temperature, 
rate changes in 10 years? Yeah, I think it's the, the similar, similar answer to that, where you can test different inputs. If you have uncertainty about the inputs, uh, especially going for the future, future inputs, you can test you know, what, what is the result if we assume this about time, and what is the result if we assume something else. So the follow-up to that is, but how is the data expressed is how uncertain is it? So if you're saying this is what we think the groundwater level is going to be like in 10 years mm -hmm. based on 20% less rainfall than what we've had historically. Yeah. And the, the uncertainty on that is, I don't know, 20%. How do we, do we get a percentage? Do we get a range? What do we get? Uh, you get, uh, you could get both of those things really. You, we, you, could, you, would, you could see what the, the resulting difference is in groundwater levels throughout the basin at specific locations. You can see what the resulting difference in groundwater flows, a small groundwater flows uh, throughout the basins or throughout the basin or in specific areas. And so um, I think as, as a baseline as of output from looking at that question, it would be groundwater levels at the wells we think are important. So, so for example, the coastal monitoring wells where we treat monitoring to assess risk of sea water treatment. What is the difference there? Uh, and then other specific basin-wide water budget flows. What, how, do, how does it look different for those? And then beyond that, it would be it, it would be based off of direction from uh, from the NGA, from from the advisory committee. We were interested in this. Now I think for sustainability indicator like groundwater surface water interaction, it, could, it would be specifically flows to and, and from streams. Um, so, so the specifics you, the, can be, uh, we can dig into the specific things that are important to the group to evaluate. There's some things that the model might provide, uh, but we would, we would say, let's be cautious about using this out, specific output. So that those, those, that could come up as well. So we have five questions on this next card, and we're going to take um, approximately five minutes to answer them. If we don't get to them all, I'm going to save these questions for the part two part of the presentation, just to make sure we have enough time um, to hear Cameron's full presentation tonight. So Becky Steinbrunner, did I pronounce your name correctly? Yes. Okay. So the first question is, what are your sources for historic data, such as climate change? Well, for historical data, um, we have, and we'll get into this um, here coming up, but we have cl climate data observed at specific stations in the basin. And so, uh, so for, for the historical, for the historical data, it's based off of the data at, um, at various, various stations uh, in or near the basin. So we'll illustrate that more. Yeah. Is that okay. or who is it? Uh, there's, there's a SIMA station in the state of California. Um, that, that's, that's the main one. And then there are a couple of uh, publicly available information about distribution of rainfall and temperature. Like the newspaper? Uh, is that it? Like the Sentinel? Like, no, it's, it's uh, <laughs> government organizations that, or universities that, that study that kind. Okay. Um, how large and how deep are the numeric cells? Uh, so, also, uh, the numeric cells are 800 feet by 800 feet, and then the, the thicknesses are based off of the, our information about how thick the aquifer and aquifer units are. So, in the graph, it looked like groundwater levels responsible to pumping levels. Please explain. So, uh, as Derek discussed in the first orientation session, how does how do groundwater levels and output of the model uh, uh, respond to changes in groundwater pumping and input to our model? And generally, uh, pumping increases, groundwater levels go down. So there's, a, there's an energy relationship. But that isn't the pattern I saw in that graph. That's why I asked the question. Oh, the time step, the time mm -hmm. step graph. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we'll get yeah, so that, that would have been a mistake. I thought I corrected that. No, it's okay. It was the first version that was that. That would be a mistake. How do you measure the 
How will the novel account for future use with the current disconnect between land use policies and water conditions? How will the model account for future use with the current disconnect between land use policies and water conditions? Uh, yeah, right now, right now the model is set up uh, pretty much assume the current land use continues going forward. Um, there, that could the better information for the development of the model that could be changed. But currently, as the model is set up, it is, it is based off of, of current land use. So are you talking with the county planning department, city planning department? Because there are big changes in the, in the pipe. Um, yeah, uh, the, basically the way that the inputs for the model are the, are the projected demands of the different water agencies, and those are based on their urban water management plans, which are based on land use projections from AMBAG and from the county, um, so that they do take into account the, the projected increases in development, but also the projected changes in technologies that may actually lead to a continued uh, decline in per capita demand. So th those are developed, not part of the model, but those are developed by the water agencies, and then those are one of the inputs that's provided to the model. Thank you. How will your model accommodate surface flows? Will it give information about stream levels in various scenarios? What is your database? <clears throat> so that's one of the reasons why GSFlow was selected, was to be able to do a uh, integrated watershed groundwater model, so stream flow is our model in this model, um, and, uh, and stream levels are also modeled, we calibrate, as we'll show, two, two stream flows, um, but right, I think we, when we do look at those results, we have to understand and what kind of precision and accuracy we can, we can use those results, results for. Thank you. And finally, how can the model be used to help us know if we are on track to avoiding undesir undesirables if as to say the undesirables are to implement independent of the model? Yeah, so uh, I, I, if I understand the question, is the, basically undesirable results are going to have to be defined by the, the, the policy makers and with all of your inputs. And then once you set, this, this is what we want the basin to look like going forward. And use the model to say, how do we get there? And how do we make sure we uh, stay there? And so you're setting kind of the future goal. And the model says, well, if we do this, do we meet that goal? And so that, that's how the model will be used and why, why the goal is set independently, actually in large part set independently. Thank you. Okay, so now we'll get into some of these details um, and cover some of this in response to the questions. Uh, so you did get a preview, um, but there are basically, because it's an integrated watershed, groundwater model, there, there is essentially the, the two parts of the model. There is the watershed part, uh, the surface part, uh, which includes climate, and then there's the, the, the groundwater part. So this is a diagram about of what the watershed model is, is doing, where it takes climate inputs and says what happens at the surface, what can run off the streams, uh, what enters the soil zone, and then potentially uh, is used up by plants uh, or just evaporates back to, to climate. And then what uh, comes through the soil zone then can become groundwater. And with our integrated model, our GS flow model, this groundwater portion is done by, is, the calculations are done by groundwater specific code, which is the USGS's mod flow. Um, and so this watershed model is, is modeling the physical processes and it's basically simulating the watershed response to, to climate effects. Um, and it does require daily time steps. <coughs> and so 
as discussed before, you're dividing up the model into many little pieces, uh, into what is called, are called hydrologic response units, and each of these units have different physical characteristics, uh, like how, what the slope is, you know, how high up it is, what's the vegetation and soil like, uh, the land use, and, and this information about how precipitation is distributed to each of these little pieces. Uh, to match up with our, our groundwater model, we make them the 800 foot by 800 foot cell grids, and a water and energy balance is calculated for, for each of them. Um, and then you can look at uh, a sum, a group of them, and say what is, what, what are the effects to the watershed and what might become groundwater for, a, for any area, a group of, of, of these units. How do we select 800 feet by 800 feet? This was a decision mostly on the watershed and the things where we wanted to make sure that we were uh, representing the elevation change over the basin. This is uh, this basin, there was quite a bit of elevation change. And 800 foot was the larger itself that size did that and did not want to go smaller than that to, to manage our, our model. Climate input data. Uh, so precipitation, uh, we are using daily data from uh, Santa Cruz and Watsonville uh, stations. These are actually, these specific stations are NOAA stations, um, from federal government uh, stations. And uh, temperature also from the Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz site. And, um, and then we did need to have some information about how it's distributed, say spatially. So we provide sp spatial distribution from a data set called DAMIT. Uh, also we needed temperature information upper in the watershed so we didn't have national data, so we used data DAMIT for that. They saw enough advice from the technical advisory committee that has been uh, advising us on this model. Uh, we, we did add the Watsonville station as a a data source for the model. So this part of the model, which is actually mostly interlaps with the Mid-County Basin a little bit, but is also east of the Mid-County Basin within the watershed is based off of the Watsonville data. And then this part is based on the Santa Cruz data. You can see the spatial distribution has changed along, along that area somewhere. In, in the in calibrating the, the water balance, the water budget for each of these, these units in the watershed, one important thing is to, to calibrate climate for potential evapotranspiration. And here we're calibrating to a SIM station of uh, state of California estimates for uh, potential evapotranspiration. We first calibrate solar radiation, which is a function of temperature, and then calibrate potential evaporation, evapotranspiration is a function of solar radiation. And this is important to calibrate because it's the amount of that is possible if you have water in your soils, how much could be taken up by plants and then never run off or, or become groundwater. So it's, it's an important part of the water budget to say how much, how much gets evapotranspiration or how, what is the potential for evapotranspiration based off of uh, how much water, water you have in the soil. Then we calibrate the watershed parameters, soil, soil properties, um, base it off of gauges that on, on the stream. So we're trying to mass the output of stream flow at these stream gauges. And so we are adjusting the properties of most of the soils in the sub-watersheds to try to match those observed stream flows. And the stream flow data, uh, typically our US Geological Survey gauges. Uh, some of these are no longer active, so we have limited time period of data to calibrate to. There are a couple of, uh, there's a county gauge that was on for a few years, and as well as some public water district uh, gauges in the upper watershed. And so we calibrate to the stream flow. Here are those gauges with the longest record, Soquel Creek at Soquel, Coralitos Creek at Freedom, uh, two uh, USGS gauges uh, just show um, a subset of years from 91 to 95. And what we're trying to do is we're not going to be able to match every change here because we're, 
we've got a basin scale model, and uh, we're just calibrating uh, what happens in the whole watershed and coming down to the gauge. You don't know what happens locally to that could affect any of these, uh, some of these changes that you observe. But what we're trying to do is get the overall pattern right. Does, does the stream flow change with in kind of the rainy season the way uh, in a similar pattern to what we're observing? And does the recession curve, how it comes down into the dry season, does the shape look uh, right, so we're matching the pattern of what is flowing in the streams and therefore what could become groundwater. And so that's what we're trying to do with, with the stream flow calibration and calibrating our, our watershed. So I want to do a call for questions again. If we could, anybody show hands for questions? Question card? Mm -hmm. Please raise your hand if you want a question card. Okay. Uh, yeah, probably has been to make clear that what we're doing is comparing outputs from the model, which is green, to measure data, which is blue. So this is part of the calibration process that I described earlier. Outputs from the model, compared to the historical observation, change the, what's in the model and try to, to match uh, the pattern of the data uh, with outputs in the model. Uh, another th one thing we use this watershed model for is to inform estimates for water use in the basin where we don't have measured data. And that is primarily water use by, uh, by pumpers or other water users that aren't served by the, the municipal water agencies. So for residential private wells, uh, we did not look for every private well that exists in the basin. We based it off of estimates for water use based off of maps of building footprints and residential parcels. So we're looking throughout the basin and saying, okay, there are these residences out there, they must be using water, they're not being served by municipal water agencies. Let's estimate what the uh, pumping is. And then we combine all that pumping so that it matches our 800 foot by 800 foot grid and enter that as model input. So uh, we, estimate, we estimate where the pumping occurs based off the building footprints and residential parcels, and we apply water use factors decline over time. So uh, we did look at data from small water systems to say what it looked like over time um, and did have a decline over time in general and an increased decline in the last you know, couple of years during the drought when there was a lot of uh, publicity about the need for conservation. Uh, so here, I'll get back to one of the earlier questions is these are estimates that have fair amount of uncertainty about. And so if this is the this is the question that needs to be explored more, we could evaluate what it would look like if these numbers change. And so if you look at it, you want to see if you're still calibrated and maybe make adjustments to make sure you're still calibrated. And then see what how the outputs for planning are affected if you make different assumptions. I did, did take the information from the watershed model to, to vary uh, outdoor use within these water use factors over time. And so uh, this, these are acre feet per year and uh, translating to approximately what the gallons per day per household would be like. Um, institutional water use and, uh, kind of define institutions pretty broadly. They include uh, schools, parks, um, some, some developments that might not be uh, provided by municipal water use. There, there, were, there were some estimates for indoor water use at these uh, locations, and then we use the information from the watershed model, uh, the mountain transpiration demand, irrigation demand to estimate outdoor water use, and also included uh, some small water system information that was available, and I think the information availability has increased uh, since 
not specifically starting in school. Agricultural use, uh, based off crop land use map. A lot of agricultural use is actually in the model is actually outside of the basin, but there is some agriculture within the basin. The outline of the basin is lighter here. It's, it's like this. Um, and then use information from the watershed model to say what is the evapotranspiration demand. Crop coefficients, coefficients that are using the Pottero Valley model to calculate what a water use by ag would be like. And also include 10% of the inefficiency that could become um, any, sorry about, any questions? Can we return the questions to Sierra and uh, Darcy? I just want to say it's hard to write our questions and still listen to what he's saying because mm -hmm. I want to hear what he's saying. Sure. But you're asking for my questions right away and I, I can't get it done. Okay, I understand. <laughs> so take your time and we'll ask okay. at the end, okay? Okay, okay. Session. thanks. Um, also related to water use, uh, estimated return flow from the water use. So for all water users, so not all of it is uh, con consumptively used where it, it leaves the system. Some of it returns to the system. Um, that includes water system losses, uh, sewage loss, so leaks and pipes basically, uh, septic system losses where uh, wastewater goes to septic systems and much of that returns to the watershed. Um, inefficient irrigation, uh, irrigation seeding, evapotranspiration demand would become uh, return to the watershed. And the way we're applying this is, is below the soil zone. So it could be more complex than that, but we are assuming that it gets into, into groundwater, uh, that it doesn't become part of the soil, the soil balance. It's a simplifying assumption to, to help uh, make the calculations more efficient. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean this water is returning to the aquifers that are providing groundwater supply. It's returning to the shallow groundwater aquifers. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that this water is getting all the way down to, to where groundwater supply is provided. And so, um, I'll take any questions on the watershed model, uh, use, and uh, thank you. So I'll work on your questions now and answer them. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm going to give you guys about a minute to write down your questions, and I'm going to start asking Cameron. Start with questions. First question is from Ned Spencer. SoCal at SoCal measured looks like much lower flow than model. Comment: This is very significant for salmon summer survival. So the, the question is uh, related to some of the times when. Uh, when the, the data show here. And so this is a log scale. So once this, when we're getting down here, we're talking about 0.1 cubic feet per second. And here it's, uh, the line above is one cubic foot per second. And it is, mm -hmm. it is true. You are not going to be able to simulate the differences between that kind of low slope. And so mm -hmm. I, when looking at the model results, Think what you have to value what are the effects at low flow when it gets down here. Can we uh, look at what the changes in flows between surf streams and, and groundwater are at those locations and say what, what is that effect like and, what, and how do we evaluate that effect? But we won't be able to say, well, this change got us from zero or, or 
Right. Right. Yeah. I, uh, oh, yeah. It's probably a log scale. But still, that's that difference is very significant. Could be very significant to the salmon summer survival, uh, even even though it's frustratingly small amount of water. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, this next question is from John Barghetto. Has the surface permeability map of the basin been completed, i.e., recharge locations? John, do you know the status of that? I think, uh, I think that maybe it's referring to some of the Virginia Fisheries. Fish 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 we do, recharge yeah, we do have uh, actually several maps of groundwater recharge. One of the older maps that the county did back in the 80s, and then more recently, Andy Fisher with UCSC has worked with the Resource Conservation District to map the whole county uh, for areas that are particularly suitable for recharge. And I think also through your PRMS modeling, you did some recharge mapping as well. So uh, we do have those. We're looking at those, and we're actually starting moving more into more site-specific confirmation of are these sites that are, look really good, are they really that good? So we're, we're actually moving towards identifying some project locations and doing more in-depth field, field testing. Thank you. From John K. Why did septic return flow be treated differently than precipitation falling in the same place? Um, there, septic return flow. Uh, a lot of it, uh, it. It depends on how it's designed. Uh, but our understanding of how it is often implemented here in this, this basin is that uh, the flows are salt root zone. And so being sub so root zone, um, and being sub root zone is more like, it is, uh, is more appropriate to put it below the soil zone in, in the model. Uh, but that's not going to be true everywhere. So it, it is, it, it, this, it is the assumption that it's all like that. Can I, help, can I help you on that one? Yes, yeah, sure. I, I, I did some modeling on that a long time ago. And basically, your, your septic tanks are about four feet below land surface. Can you speak a little louder, please? Your septic tanks are generally about four feet below surface, if not greater. And so they don't have a chance to evaporate like rain hitting the surface would evaporate. So when you put it below you know, the septic system, the fluid comes out subsurface, usually a couple feet below. And I think that's why you accounted for it. And it could still come into the soil zone, but it has to be as a result of groundwater being being raised such that it goes up into the soil zone. So that's still still a dynamic possibility in, in this model. But um, but we put it because of it's not landed on the surface. We think it's, it's entering the system below uh, below the below the uh, Below the root zone. Is that the root zone? Is that the root zone? It's not It is? No. No. Don't worry about it. You're fine. Thanks. It's OK. OK, John Lear is asking a question. How was distance away from the coast selected for the ocean boundary? Yeah, so uh, it's, it's, a, it's one mile off the coast. And uh, we selected it based off of of the cross-sectional modeling that we've done previously, uh, which I talked about some in the State of the Basin presentation, helped us define protective elevations. Uh, and so, th and that was about one mile, and, and we were able to use that distance. And we had done some testing with those cross-sectional models to say, what are the, um, you know, what are the pathways for, uh, salt water to enter the aquifers, and one mile worked in that case. Now, it, it could be, and I've had discussions with uh, technical advisory committee members about this, is that in the future, if, if management of the basement needs to look at effects that get close to that distance, that the grid would have to be expanded. But uh, we are starting with this, and it was designed based on the cross-sectional modeling, and uh, we'll, we'll see if, if it would be, need to be expanded in the future. 
Thank you. This question's from Reagan Ray. You kind of were vague about water restart, recharge by such items as septic tank discharge and other items, and that you ended the analysis by starting the water, by stating the water might or might not get down to the aquifer. What does that mean? Um, so we, we are adding the water to the system. Um, and, uh, and this is related to the earlier question about why not add it at the very top, at the surface. And we are adding it below the soil zone. So it's not part, it's, the water isn't immediately available for any plants there to evapotranspirate where the water would be taken up by the plants. It does, it does add, is added to the groundwater system. But, um, and we haven't really covered this in detail yet, but the, the groundwater system represents the stacked aquifer units that make up yeah, the basin. And maybe my voice will make it through this. Anyway. <laughs> um, the, 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 stacked, the stacked aquifer system uh, is represented by uh, the groundwater portion of the model with the model of layers that I referenced earlier. So it's going, so the water that's being added is being added to the, the, sh the shallower layers when the deeper layers are more likely to be pumped. So the water that's being added may not add to the water supply that, that's being added. Follow. Thank you. Uh, I couldn't understand your reasoning at all for that explanation. You, you started off talking about surface ground, but the septic tanks, for example, they're deeper, and as the other gentleman explained, it's not going to, and you, that it's not going to evaporate so much, so it has a better chance, to my way of looking, to get down than rainwater. Yes, it does have a better chance. But it sounds like you end up again saying you don't think you, it didn't sound like you think it's meaning getting down in any meaningful amount. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. So it did not phrase that well. Um, I I think it, I just wanted to make clear that it wasn't definitely getting to the deeper. That's ground. even less helpful. Um, so I think it has a greater chance. I think the word, uh, the important word there is is chance that it has a greater chance to get to the deeper groundwater. Uh, but that's not doesn't mean it, that it's a hundred percent chance. Are you giving it anything? Are you giving it a zero then? Or are you, what are you giving? It? No, we're not giving it a zero. We are giving it. We are giving it flows, and we're letting the We're using the models to see what the effect is. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Let me, we, we get that question all the time at the district. I mean, so what's happening is, and maybe this will help, and tell me if this adds to a, a, a typical site might be pumping groundwater from 200 feet below land surface, pulling it up, and then using it and discharging into a septic tank that's a couple feet below land surface. That recharge where you're pulling the water up from may have occurred way up in the mountains. Where you're putting it back in, in the septic tank, there may, except in the aromas, which is kind of like a big sandbox, so to speak, but in the prisma, there are many layers. So when you put it in the septic tank, that's only a couple feet below land surface, in the prisma, it has to go through multiple layers, and I think that's what Cameron's referring to, so it's, it's, a, it's kind of complex. But Ron, so does the rain have to go through multiple layers? It does, it does, but the, a lot of the rain's happening, the recharge is happening up in the, it gets down is happening up in So up you're saying it depends on where the septic tank is located. And the rim. And compared to the rim. Right. But, but most septic leach fields are pit 60, sometimes 60 feet or deeper. No, no, no. 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 So we're going to move on because we have about uh, four more questions and we still have two more parts of the presentation. So the question by Tom Stumbaugh. The significant reduction in water use in private well households leads to the question, how was the reduction accomplished and what impact has it had on the nature and the quality of people's lives? 
Um, yeah, so I, I, the reduction was, uh, I, I think, based off of conservation, people actively trying to use less water, and uh, I, I can't answer the second part of the question. Okay, I'm gonna move on to Becky. Becky has three. Take three, I didn't look at the back, Becky. No, you have six. We're gonna get three of them and we're gonna move on and I'll hold the other three. So how would public input influence part four achieving sustainability in the models? It's left over from last time. Um, well, public input uh, is the process for defining sustainability is, is a public process. The Groundwater Advisory Committee meetings are, are public. And, uh, the, and as when they do that, and also the MGA board meetings when they finalize the decisions are, are public. And so those are opportunities of private input on, on the sustain, sustainability criteria. And then, uh, that, that is not going to be at the end of the drone sustainability process, plan process. That's going to be somewhat earlier, so we can use those uh, criteria that uh, have been informed by the public input and decided by the NGA board uh, to evaluate projects and whether they meet those goals of sustainability. Okay, next question. Your surface stream flow data is based on 1991 to 1995 records only. What about data from 1995 to present? 1996 was El Nino, for example, and 2013 to 16 was drought. Yeah, so we do calibrate to the whole uh, time period from 85 to 2015. This example I do, I wanted to zoom in on these few years. Uh, because one, for uh, we we did an initial calibration for this shorter time period, the, the shorter runs that could help us. But then it applied in the whole time period, and we checked that. But we wanted to zoom in to, to look to look closer at how it's going. Okay. The last question: Your residential estimates for private well pumpers was equal to high. How exactly did you develop that? Was equal to high. Is that what you meant, Becky? Yeah, like 400 gallons per day well, the early for days. a residential private well. How do you? How did you come up with that? Those figures. So uh, we did move backward. Uh, so we the more recent information, we have more better data uh, to to apply, and then um, we moved back to information documentation from. Uh, some reports in the late 90s, and so there we did assume that there, that did ref those changes did reflect a change in water usage. So there, there was more water usage early on. Ralph, do you want to add something? I just want to add that historic they used to use central water district's uh, usage for the private well users, since our um, area was similar to some of the other areas uh, for private water use. Um, also, Trout Gulch's data was used. Oh, so it came from smaller water companies, not necessarily private well owners? Correct. Well, I mean, you're it was estimates were based but. on the smaller water systems. Because we didn't have all the private well systems numbers. It was, it was based, on, based on systems that we had metered information for. The, now we, we have metered information for a lot more systems, so we're going to be able to provide that out. We have metered information for, for some private wells, but uh, not a lot. <laughs> So for, so for uh, modeling groundwater flow, um, we, we are integrating it with the watershed model that was just described and using the USGS code GSflow, uh, which adds the watershed model uh, PRMS plus uh, mod flow. And so this is the watershed portion, and it provides uh, recharge to the groundwater portion, which is uh, mod flow, and then both can provide uh, flows to, to streams. Um, and as mentioned uh, previously, uh, we are modeling the stacked aquifer units that are 
uh, main feature of, of this basin. And so we model the, the different aquifer and aquitar layers uh, with different, with the deeper, older Prisma uh, units outcropping to the west, overlying by the aromas to the east. You can see how this is represented in the model uh, with these different cross sections. This cross section is uh, approximately along Highway 1, this, this red one. And again, you see the cross section with aquifer units outcropping to the west and overlying uh, uh, aromas. And you can also look at how it goes up north. This green line cross section is the Stokio Creek. Uh, where it's over Prisma aquifers, aquifer units, and then this one is offshore. Uh, so you see the different aquifer units we're representing in, in the model. Uh, boundary conditions in the model. Um, this, the groundwater in this area is connected to groundwater in, in other basins, but we can't model everything, so we represent uh, those connections with boundary conditions. Um, so there are heads based off of data for boundary conditions at the Santa Margarita end of uh, things and then also at the Pajaro Valley. Um, our concept is that flow is from the northwest to southeast in the Prisma Highlands area. Uh, north of Zion Fault, this is north of, of the Santa Cruz Mid County Basin, but included in the model uh, as part of the watershed. And um, and so we have a, a water level to, to provide that, to have that flow go out in that direction as the boundary conditions. Important boundary conditions is how we're representing uh, the boundary offshore. So as uh, the outcrops show, some of these outcrops occur offshore, and that's a potential pathway for seawater intrusion. And the boundaries there are represented by seawater. So they're, even though those water levels are at sea level, they are, because seawater is denser than freshwater, those boundary conditions are higher than zero, representing the, uh, the denser seawater. Uh, at depth, we also represent this boundary by um, assuming that it is salty at depth in these locations. And that gets back to the question is whether that that boundary makes sense and that assumption makes sense for that distance offshore. And so that's, that's, one, of the, um, us, that's one of the assumptions we make is that at, at a mile offshore, at that, it, it, is, it is faulty at that location. In calibrating the model, we did uh, decide that it, we sh should consider a conceptual model change Previously, as far as faulting, only the Zioni Fault, which divides the Mid-County Basin from the Prisma the Highlands, was included in the model. Um, for example, that's, that was what was modeled in the Central Water District model. But there are some steep gradient, groundwater gradients from inland to, to the coast in the aquifer units. Um, and in looking at information from the USGS about seismicity data, it did indicate that there was some faulting uh, between the coast and Zion Fault. And given the observations of steep groundwater gradients, uh, we thought a conceptual model change to include a fault in the location, which we refer to as the Aptus Fault, which is uh, completely unofficial, but um, included that in, in the model. I just want to, so questions again, we'll be passing out cards, and this time when you're done writing your question, if you could just raise your hand, we'll pick that up so it's not so disruptive. Um, so with the groundwater flow calibration, uh, just like with uh, what we talked about with introducing groundwater modeling, we, we, fair, we change the different properties of groundwater conditions, hydraulic conductivity, uh, specific storage, specific yield, the conditions of the boundary uh, conditions to try to uh, match groundwater levels with observed observations. So we have the inputs about pumping and climate, and we 
uh, change how the model processes it to try to match the outputs from the model to, to the observation. Uh, this does result in, in does implement what uh, they're introduced that there could be a lot of lateral variability in the basin. So we do have a good model of uh, spatial heterogeneity to help us uh, match outputs from the model to observations. This is horizontal hydraulic conductivity in different layers uh, in the model in the basin. You can see uh, approximate location of of where we added that as fault as this, this yellow line, and uh, the bluer numbers are lower hydraulic conductivity, while the, the uh, purplish numbers are, are generally higher horizontal hydraulic conductivity. So, an example of, of what we're doing with uh, calibration, and uh, we, we have observed or interpreted results with these contour maps based off of observed data. We compare the pattern to our model results over an area, but also uh, model results as green line versus uh, the blue dots, the blue observations, to match the pattern of how uh, groundwater level changes uh, with the model and how it compares to the observations. An example of what we can get out of the model is we can get a budget for the mid-county basin, different kinds of flows, both coming in and, and coming um, and leaving the basin, leaving groundwater. So there's pumping, uh, flows in from other basins, flows in from offshore, uh, what is lost to the surface, what is lost to the stream flow. Um, and this is the kind of output we can get from, from the calibrated model. Uh, to, give you an example of uh, what model output can also look like. Um, we show what groundwater levels look like over time uh, in, in an aquifer with a, uh, a short animation um, and uh, requires changing out of the presentation. And I guess this is also a good time to do a time setting up to work on the questions or raise them. Uh, okay. 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 So this, is the, what you're going to see here is the Parisima A unit. Uh, so it's on the western side of the basin, um, probably the more, most productive Parisima unit. And it's, uh, it's colors representing groundwater levels over time where the maroonish colors are, are below sea level, uh, green and yellow between 0 and 10 feet, MSL blue above 10, 10 feet. And early on there were, uh, in, there were more water levels for longer, larger areas below sea level, and those areas decreased over time and, and occurred for, for less amount of the time. Um, representing the recovery that the model is simulating uh, that has been observed in this basin in, in these aquifers. So this is the kind of output that uh, we, we, get, uh, we get from the model. Red is low. Red is low. Red is below What's this area? Is this the whole basin? No, this is, is, this is the, this is the Prisma A aquifer unit. So um, this is m more the, the western half. Where, where pumping occurs in person, AL. Okay, what was the time frame on this? Uh, it started in, um, in 2004. Thank you. And then it's going about 2015. So, yeah, when we sharpen it up, we'll, we can post the times on there. I don't understand what we're looking at. I'm really sorry. I just oh, no don't worries. get this at all. Okay, so if we could pause it. Um, we're, we're looking at uh, color representation of, of groundwater levels. And so uh, the redder colors are the lower colors, and the bluer colors, sorry, the redder, color, red, the redder colors are the lower levels. Oh, uh, well, Yes, so uh, red means it's below sea level. Groundwater levels. Groundwater levels. 
of one particular aquifer level. Yeah, of one one aquifer level over, over, right. over time. Yeah. And in the blue, the blue are the higher ground level levels. So uh, in inland, closer to the recharge, we see higher groundwater levels. Um, this, as the A aquifer unit goes deeper to this location, there isn't as much pumping. So again, you have higher hydraulic, high, higher groundwater levels. In this area, there is pumping. And so groundwater levels are expected to be lower. And is this generally in the bay, and that's so that sort of center, that sort of 41st Avenue up that way where the red starts, and that kind of yeah. Way? So these dots are where wells are located, both monitoring wells and production wells. So you can see where the wells are located. This approximately is the coastline. Yeah. Um, this, this is the belts well field area ah. where the Santa Cruz pumps from. Uh -huh. um, so Tell Creek Water District's wells in this unit are are in this in this area. Right. And so there has been um, there has been drawdown in this area because the pumping right. definitely is expected. You're going to get drawdown with with pumping. And so the question is, how big is it? How how long does it last? Does it extend out to how how deep is it once it's out to the coast? Mm -hmm. So around the wells, you're going to get groundwater levels below sea level, and, and that's what we're seeing here. Mm -hmm. the, the, the question is, once you get out to the coast where you need it to be high enough to prevent seawater intrusion, how, what are the levels? And so we want to make sure that the, the drawdown area is small enough so that at, by, at the coast there is uh, groundwater levels that protect against seawater intrusion. What's the time period? It starts in 2004. What was this? 2015. 2015. Yeah. So in yellow is what? Yes. Yellow yes. is above sea level uh, between zero and five feet, so it's generally below protected elevations yeah. that we established. Could the lights turn on? And this is based on real data. This is not a model. This is a model. That's the model. This is a model that calibrated to data. So this is a model. This is a model. Based on the data. Calibrated to the data. So if you have any questions you're still running, please get those to Sierra or Darcy. Raise your hand. Um, this question is from Ned Spencer. Very roughly, what would the net offshore flow be in acre feet per year estimated by modeling? Um. So I, I think there, there's a certain amount of flow offshore that will be required to prevent seawater intrusion. Um, we've we've previously we've previously estimated <coughs> those uh, those amounts with the cross-sectional model, and that's something that we will do with this model. Yet we haven't haven't done it. I think if we looked at it historically, we could look at what the model is showing. Historic, historically flows, which is those results you just show. Models based the model shows results based off of uh, historical, and that we can say is not enough flow offshore because uh, historically our groundwater levels have not been high enough to prevent seawater intrusion uh, over the long term. <laughs> so that as the first cut can say, well, we know there needs to be more offshore flow than this. As part of the future simulations. Uh, the idea is to evaluate what kind of plans get you your basin to groundwater levels that prevent seawater intrusion. Oh, sorry. Uh, what kind of plans uh, get your uh, basin to groundwater levels that prevent seawater intrusion? And then what are those flows? And that can give you an idea of what flows are necessary offshore to, to prevent seawater intrusion and be sustainable for that indicator. Mm -hmm. In the spirit of time, I'm going to ask the um, next couple questions from Becky's last round, and then I'm going to hold the questions till the end so Cameron can finish the fourth part of the presentation. So the next question is, will your model take into account transpiration rates and water use of future cannabis industry? <laughs> well, it could uh, if, there was, sure. if there was a change in how we implemented land use. Right now, we're not. We're not 
we're not implementing that specifically. Um, what is PRMS ET demand? Uh, PRMS is the model that does the watershed uh, modeling. Uh, so it, it models the climate. It's the USGS code. It stands for Participate Precipitation Runoff Modeling System. And ET is evapotranspiration. So what uh, PRMS does is it calculates calibrated uh, potential evapotranspiration. If the, the soils were completely saturated, how much uh, water would be taken up by plants and then evaporated to the atmosphere. And then, as part of the water system, based off how much rainfall, actu rainfall actually occurs, it says how much water is available to be evapotranspirated. And if you're irrigating that area, you, you want your plants to have all the valve transpiration, so the demand is the difference between the potential and the rainfall of valve transpiration. Thank you. Lights, please. So, modeling future projects. We develop the model and calibrate it, an idea of uncertainties uh, related to it. Uh, you want to use it as a tool for your planning. And uh, a lot of it is related to uh, modeling future projects and the effects of those projects. And part of that can be to evaluate sustainability, but there are also other evaluations that can be done as well. And so uh, different groundwater management strategies that will be evaluated with the model included uh, just what you do if uh, you didn't do anything, just as a baseline. Um, and then also, Evaluate possibilities of reduced pumping, related to conservation, possibly a transfer of treated surface water, and then a couple other projects that Soquel Creek Water District and City of Santa Cruz are looking at, and looking at separately from uh, the MGA's work. So it includes replenishing the basin of uh, entire purified water, Soquel Creek Water District's Pure Water Soquel plan, and, uh, project that they're evaluating with the EIR. Um, City of Santa Cruz for storage and recovery project that is being evaluated uh, as a result of the you know, water supply advisory committee. Um, so, in addition to looking at reduced pumping, the MGA will likely look at the results of the evaluation of those projects and say, uh, should we evaluate some version of those to specifically address basic sustainability? Because those projects don't are specifically designed to, to get the basin to, to sustainability. So there might need to be a further evaluation for that. Um, going forward, the inputs, we have inputs to the model. We, and when you look at the future, you do have to make assumptions for some of these inputs. And so for groundwater pumping demand, uh, we make assumptions about what the projections are going to be like going forward. And John mentioned this earlier, but for pumping plans, they're based off of the urban water management plan projections for Soquel Creek Water District. We kind of go back to pumping demand pre-drop for Central Water District. City of Santa Cruz is not so much based off of the demand because most of the demand is met by the surface water supply. It's more based off of their plans for the groundwater pumping, which are included in their cooperative agreement for groundwater management for the western part of the prisma. And then for non-municipal pump, municipal pumping, we uh, are assuming that pumping goes back to the pre-drought estimates. So the, the latest drop that occurred uh, uh, assume rebounds to what was just before, but it's not back to the highest amount of the early part of the simulation. And again, these are assumptions that we are inputting into the model to as a, a baseline to evaluate different projects. And uh, the, the assumptions can be uh, about the, the uh, sensitivities of these assumptions can be evaluated with the model. So a reduced pumping simulation, the plan for the simulation is to evaluate what if the demand continued to be what it was like achieved over the last few years of the recent drought, and also add in the transfer of 
treated surface water from the city to the Silicon Creek Water District. And that transfer allows for a, a reduction in pumping by the district. And that's something called inlet recharge, where uh, a different water supply provides uh, a way to reduce pumping and uh, recover the basin, provide uh, in lieu recharge. Uh, Pure Water Soquel is another project that's being evaluated. Uh, this involves a recharge into the Prisma and then uh, uh, two recharge wells for our sites under consideration. And the idea is not just to add more water uh, into the Prisma to increase pumping. The plan is that Soquel would not increase their water supply, but they the recharger would allow them to redistribute the pumping, increase pumping in the recharge, and decrease pumping in other areas, and hopefully achieve in the recharge. So that's the idea behind this chart, where pumping near recharge is this amount before the project starts. And once the project starts, when recharge occurs, adding water to the system would increase pumping near, uh, near the recharge and decrease pumping elsewhere. This is the kind of input we put in the model to see what the, the outcomes for the groundwater basin look like. The city of Santa Cruz uh, for storage recovery, also recharging the Prisma, the idea of storage to be attract, extracted to meet surface water uh, shortfalls. Uh, three different scenarios. A scenario which involves in lieu recharge, providing water to the Soquel Creek Water District to reduce pumping and store water in that manner, uh, recharging water directly at wells and extracting from those wells, and a combination of those, those two. So this is what uh, the combination <coughs> could look like, is where some water is provided so that Soquel is reduced pumping, some water is provided so that, uh, to recharge directly at wells, and then the city would recover that stored water over time. So again, input to the model to test what the groundwater level outcomes would be based off of this input. And what, what are, how do we evaluate the outcomes? How do we evaluate the model results? We will look at the simulated groundwater levels and compare them to sustainable management criteria that are based off of groundwater levels. So this is where proxies for sustainable management criteria that are groundwater level proxies can be useful because they can be directly compared to model results. Uh, this is an example from Seaside Basin. They had protective water level, they had different potential uh, plans to evaluate, to get to that protective level, and they could evaluate which ones achieved it and which ones sustained it over the long term. Um, water budget components, extreme flow can be evaluated. Uh, for pure water soquel, there's an effort to evaluate where the recharge water goes and how fast gets there. Uh, we'll be implementing that, that new package to evaluate the seawater interface model in 2018. Call for questions, so raise your hand if you'd like a card, please. So I mentioned one of the main inputs of the model is climate, and uh, so for future simulations, uh, we'll be putting inputting different assumptions for climate into the model, and seeing the effect of those, and then what, what, how different projects and plans look under those different climates. And so there are a number of different uh, climate sets that we are using for input. Uh, one of them is repeating the calibration period of 1985 to 2015. Now, uh, that's certainly not going to happen exactly the way it is, and people think it's not going to happen. Uh, it's not going to be that similar. But it is important to run uh, because we have calibrated to that period, so we can use that as uh, a baseline comparison to say, okay, did, does this make sense under the climate we calibrated to? And then we can 
go beyond that with other climates as well. And the other climates include, uh, for city of Santa Cruz, the model's been used to, um, to model an earlier period because the way that the ASR uh, plan was developed was to address the drought shortfall that occurred <coughs> in the 70s. We want to test it on that period. Uh, we also are using a catalog climate, which I'll describe in a, in a little bit, which is using historical data, but uh, mostly warm years from that historical data set. Then we're also using uh, other models, global circulation models, that provide projections of uh, future climate and downscaling it to our basin as inputs to, to our model. And the city of Santa Cruz uh, previously used uh, one specific global circulation model to do their planning, and so uh, we started with that because of its uh, availability and, and this is work that is funded specifically by the city. But, and so that work is, is being done and will be available to the NGA for its work. But we did think it was important to evaluate whether that would be appropriate going forward for planning. And so uh, what we proposed and the NGA board approved is an evaluation of the ensemble of global circulation models and, and see whether that, that one would be appropriate, the one that's already done would be appropriate to use or whether something else should be done. So to describe uh, some of the uh, future climates that are being, that are being modeled, one of them is this catalog approach, and this was suggested by Technical Advisory Committee member uh, Andy Fischer, professor at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, it's also an approach uh, followed by a metropolitan model district in Southern California, which is basically using historical data, uh, but using the warmer years from the historical data set, because we expect our climate to be warmer. So uh, from the, the last century or so, taking for the 5% hottest years, 50% of, of our catalog is based off of that, and 80% of our catalog are 25% hottest years. So it's a, a warmer than what, was, what occurred historically, um, but if you look at the resulting averages, we're talking uh, about an increase of one and a half degrees Fahrenheit, you're familiar with some projections that is definitely on the low end of what would be expected for warming. But the one reason why uh, it was recommended and uh, I think it was a worthwhile exercise is that this is actual climate that occurred. So as far as all the complicated the relationships that occur in climate between rainfall and, and temperatures is something that occurred that we know uh, is, is physically possible. So, uh, so that is one of the climate inputs we are using for uh, the future projection. The other one is uh, downscaling of a specific global uh, circulation model. Uh, and the global circulation models have been downscaled to six kilometer grids, but then we want to double the downscale it even further to our specific stations that we're using for input for our model. Uh, so, um, hire a researcher, there's a research institute to help us downscale, uh, do this downscaling, <coughs> and we're using that for the evaluations for Santa Cruz. The SR will be available for MGA as well. But is that the appropriate one to use uh, going forward? And that's why we're evaluating uh, the ensemble of uh, available global climate models, global circulation models. And did learn something about how what DRWR is planning on guidance for uh, climate change modeling. And they're following the similar approach to what they outlined in the water, their water storage investment program evaluations. And, and that's really using an ensemble average. And so that is what they're planning on providing. Um, so if, you're, if your assumptions are more conservative than that ensemble average, I think for the most part what the city has done is more conservative than it would be acceptable for the GSP. So that's the guidance, kind of the minimum gate guidance from DWR. With the MGA, this group can decide 
to, to do something differently. To say that that's not that standard isn't what we want to meet. We, we were concerned that it could be worse than that, for example. So, so that's that's a choice that uh, a decision that can be made um, by by the locals, and and so. So we are uh, evaluating this ensemble, presenting to the technical advisory committee, and get their feedback, and then bring it also to the uh, GSP advisory committee to, to get their feedback. Um, sea level rise, we are uh, simulating with our future um, model projections, and that basically means changing the boundary condition offshore, uh, the projections. Uh, are an increase of one and a half feet over our, our time period. Since, well, to the end of our GSP planning period, 2070 compared to 2000, is one and a half feet increase. Uh, research has shown that the sea level rays may propagate inland so that uh, the effects are not that substantial. Uh, I think the climate effects are more likely to be a bigger deal, but we are testing that. That is something we are we are including. <laughs> uh, next steps after our cards are finished with you can hand them in or keep on working on them. The, for the NGA modeling, uh, we will document calibrations of some of the specific questions uh, that have come up. We'll go into more detail with that documentation for discussion with the, the tag. Um, and uh, and our attack is made up of five members, uh, so they are, they include uh, PhDs in in the field, as well as uh, certified hydrogeologists, um, both uh, uh, both consultants and uh, neighboring part of the water management agency. Um, Groundwater management simulations, we will be simulating the reduced pumping alternative and look at developing runs based off the results of the project studies that are occurring, evaluating the climate change ensemble. And I mentioned earlier that, uh, the, that the county has a grant to fund a lot of runs to evaluate effects of different groups of pumpers, uh, like, like inland pumpers or different areas on, on the basin. Those, those are the next steps for us. Thank you. So, um, David Baskin, what is a proxy? So, a proxy is uh, an alternative uh, for the criteria. So, the, sustain the sustainability indicator, some are uh, in they're specifically in the groundwater sustainability plan regulations allowing for these groundwater level proxies. And so what it means is that you have a sustainability indicator that isn't specific to groundwater levels. There's, there are those as well. Um, but if you can show a relationship between groundwater levels and that indicator, like seawater intrusion or, uh, or subsidence, you can show that relationship. You can use your, you can use groundwater levels as your sustainability criteria instead of, or in addition to, uh, something more specifically representing seawater intrusion subsidence, for example. And so, uh, so for the seawater intrusion, which I think is the more relevant sustainability indicator in, in this basin. An example would be some version of the protective elevations that uh, have been estimated for some kind creek water at the coastal monitoring levels. So these were basically how high the groundwater levels need to be to prevent seawater intrusion long <coughs> term. And those are groundwater levels, not specifically where the seawater interface is, uh, but those groundwater levels, uh, we could show that they are protective against seawater intrusion and used as your sustainability criteria. And, and so instead of, and, I, and, I, and I, it's something I do think is, is 
I highly recommend considering because um, specifically for seawater intrusion, uh, we haven't seen seawater intrusion in coastal monitoring wells, but we we'll want to make sure that we reduce the risk of seawater intrusion with water levels that are high enough. And so that's what a proxy can achieve. The other thing about a groundwater level proxy that is beneficial is that it's easier to compare to model results and uh, observations. Because groundwater levels are something that's uh, more easily monitored than, than water quality. So that, that's, what, uh, that's what the proxy is designed to do. So a proxy is a manner of testing an assumption? Well, it's, it's more of an alternative to evaluating. Uh, it's more of an alternative to evaluating a, a basin condition, and so a basin. And so I think that's something that would still need to be tested. That that assumption, the relationship, because if you if you were to set a groundwater level proxy and you were achieving that goal, but say seawater intrusion still came in, then you would have to change your, your proxy. You, it would not be meeting sustainability. But it's just, it's something that will help, uh, help with planning and help with management. Great. So Tom Stum, um, Bob, you have a I should have been here for the three earlier sessions, so I might possibly have been able to understand, but I wasn't, so I didn't get very much out of this. One thing came to mind, however, and that is I'd like to know why SoCal Creek Water District seems unwilling to accept water offered by the City of Santa Cruz to be stored in our aquifer and wants to spend 10 times as much money to give us toilet water to drink. Tom, do you want a response to that or is it rhetorical? <laughs> you read my question. <laughs> Next question. Thank you. First of all, do I have any other questions coming on the audience? Becky, well, I will ask your last question from the last session, Becky, while you continue to write. You said septic returns are shallow recharge. What is shallow? What about soil types? Um, well, what I consider shallow is um, is generally where uh, saturated water is first encountered, and so um, and so that is generally an aquifer unit that is uh, first encountered by any percolating water. Um, that's generally not the aquifer that is pumped to any large degree, but. Uh, But it is, it is groundwater, um, so it's recharged to groundwater. Um, soil types, we, we do, it is part of our calibration to calibrate soil types so that the water that falls on the surface where we are calibrating to the, the stream flows so that the, the soil and the way they, the, the way it, um, the way it holds water uh, the way it releases water to the surface and potentially to streams uh, allows water to flow through it down into groundwater are are uh, are calibrated. So your cells are able to calibrate the 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 return to different areas of different soil types according to uh, the interaction within the cells and septic, septic recharge? Uh, yes, generally. Uh, I did mention that, um, that the septic we're applying below the soil root zone, but uh, it is, so then it's more related to the, the properties of, of the groundwater sediments that are first, the groundwater properties of the aquifer unit that it is applied to. Uh, so, but it is, uh, <coughs> it, is uh, it is part of the system and can, if groundwater levels get high enough, be released to, to the surface. So, so it is, there is an interrelationship. Great. And while people are working on a few extra questions, and for those who I know may be eager to um, get on with their evening, while I wait for those questions, and please feel free to stay, I want to just close out with next steps. 
we cover that, can anyone? Oh, here we go. Um, so the groundwork <coughs> sustainability planning process, uh, it comes as follows. Phase one has been October 1st to the end of this year. And that's largely been on the orientation of and the Groundwater Sustainability Plan Advisory Committee convening and developing the charter. So we've largely done that through, through this year. Next year is going to be spent on the basin setting, sustainability indicators, risk analysis, potential projects and actions to support basin restoration and sustainability, which Cameron talked about in the groundwater modeling context. And then um, in 2019, from January to June, final recommendations, cost analysis, and user impacts, legal issues, and implementation of financial planning is going to occur. So that's the overall process. And post this meeting, how you can remain involved after all oh, this is the fourth and last orientation meeting, but we invite you to participate in the upcoming meetings. The next one's going to be on January 24th. But we've listed all these meetings on the website, so we invite you to look at that and calendar your time. There are a lot of very interesting questions. It's clear there's you know, very enthusiastic interest in this topic. So we encourage you to stay involved, bring your input, so the considerations can be transferred into the planning process. So is there any questions um, before I answer more technical questions or questions regarding Cameron's presentation? regarding the process and the next steps. Okay, we invite you to stay, and um, if there's any other questions, Sierra and Darcy? Thank you. For those of you who would like to adjourn, we're going to stay and answer these final questions. Thank you, Cameron, very much. Great presentation. Move on to the last questions. Yeah, I just wanted to thank everybody for being here. I, I'd like you to stay engaged. Um, these are the, you know, the workshop. We're going to have future workshops, and um, I know these take a lot of our time in the evening, but we really appreciate you being here and being part of it. And uh, I'd like to thank Ellen for being here. This is our uh, first time having you with us, and CC Vu. Thank you, and everybody else, especially Tim Carson and Sierra, and everybody who puts this together. So uh, again, thank you very much. Thank you. And I just want to be clear, we have time to answer these questions. The I think so. Here. I think okay, so. great, yeah. great. If thank anybody you. wants to stay, we can. If you have to go, please do. Okay, so I'm having a little bit of eye issue. I did turn 50 this year, so you got to give me a break. <laughs> Keith um, Gudger, did I pronounce that? Yeah. Did I pronounce it correctly? Thank you, Keith. Will the GSP allow for changes that will invariably happen in the model input data? Yes. Yeah. And I think, I think implementation of the GSP will, or the GSP will allow for that. But we have to plan for changes that are going to take place over time, and that's part of your input in the model. Right, I think that there's the opportunity to continue using the model during the implementation and adjust as necessary. Okay, Becky's questions. Um, how do you use SkyTem and DualM? Did I pronounce that right? There's a lot of model acronyms out there. Study results in your model. So, uh, where I think SkyTem will be used is with uh, the seawater interface modeling and we, we can use the, SkyTem will give us information about where the seawater interface is, which we didn't have before. And as a result, we can use that information to provide an initial condition for our future models to say, let's put it here, we now actually have information about where it is, let's put it where it is now, and uh, see how it moves over the future under these different plans and projects. And, and we, won't, we won't have calibrated the movement of the seawater interface because we don't have the historical picture of how it moves, how it got to where it is. But at least we've calibrated the groundwater levels that are, uh, that are driving its movement going forward. And so that is, will be the best information that we have to, to say what the interface will do <coughs> into the future. How often do you think it would be a benefit to repeat this snapshot of the interface? Yeah, I, I think um, 
it would be beneficial to repeat at a, at a regular interval. Um, I think there has been discussion uh, at the MGA level of, of something every five years, which I think is an appropriate amount of time because I don't expect it to move that quickly on a year-to-year -year basis, but um, it, that, that kind of time frame I think would be appropriate. Becky, I just wanted to confirm, is this the graphic you're referring to? Yes. Okay, can you explain, sense. can you explain the turquoise and magenta diagram? I did not understand that. So this is, uh, is how we are, uh, we've implemented the property of hydraulic conductivity in, in the model. So hydraulic conductivity is basically uh, what is used to say how groundwater is part of the equation for groundwater flow, uh, where uh, the amount of flow, the higher the hydraulic conductivity, means more flow can occur. Uh, and so, in calibrating the model, some areas needed higher hydraulic conductivity, and some areas needed lower hydraulic conductivity, and the different aquifer units. And what this shows is the variation that sh that occurred that we're using in the model to calibrate. So the, the magenta is higher hydraulic conductivities, and the blues are, are lower hydraulic conductivities. And so it's, a, it's just showing what, uh, what kind of lateral variability we are using to be able to calibrate the model to, to data. Thank you. Thank you. I, when I saw the word conductivity, I was thinking, Salt water. Uh, so thank you for clearing that up. I didn't get that out. So we have several more questions. So why use the same climate change? Why not use the same climate change global model as Santa Cruz is using? Why is Santa Cruz using a different model than you are using? Um, I, I think it's possible to go for, potentially go forward with the global climate model that uh, Santa Cruz is using. Um, I, what we would propose is just to evaluate it and then make sure that the, the group that's not, that involves more groups in the city of Santa Cruz is com comfortable with using that or deciding to use something else. So that, that's what our evaluation is doing. The, the reason, one of the reasons why we did um, we, we also did this catalog climate approach was uh, at, at the time, the, the way to implement kind of downscaling of, of the, the global climate model wasn't available with the modeling tools from the USGS. So we wanted an alternative to look at climate change, and that was an alternative that was proposed by the technical advisory committee, and so uh, we, we undertook that, that effort. But now, now we have, we, we do have both and we can compare the results of both. But um, going forward, I think the, the NGA will choose what makes more sense to evaluate. And, and because of looking at, you know, looking at these projections of hotter climates than we have observed historically. My my uh, anticipation is that for the idea and to meet what the DWR guidance is going forward, some kind of something related to these whole climate circulation models that will probably be used Thank for you. the GSP. Would your model evaluate effects of regional solutions, river water transfers, and in loop? Yes. So that's, um, we get at that with this reduced pumping simulation. So any in lieu recharge is somewhat, uh, somewhat independent of what the source of the in lieu recharge is. There's some timing issues that, that are incorporated, but anything, any simulation that includes uh, an assumption in the input of reduced pumping could represent a simulation of inward recharge. Thank you.
Why did your future pumping rates significantly drop in 2030? Why was there a big jump from 2016 to 2017? Uh, so, so the reason why, uh, there's a couple slides here. The reason why we jumped from 2016 to 2017 is that uh, in setting it up, we were using the actual 2016 pumping data, which uh, represented a lot of conservation. In 2017, we were representing, uh, we're setting up the future, representing the future projection. And so uh, we had seen the observed what was pumped in 2017. And so from 2017 on, it's really a projection of what future pumping uh, is is planned for and from the urban water management plan for some urban water district and, and other, other projections. So uh, that's that's why 2016, 2017 there's a job. So 2016 represents actual data, 2017 represents uh, a future projection. Um, the 2017 was lower than that projection. And we're just trying to say well what what's the idea most likely to be going forward. For 2030, that's just a representation of what the, what's in the urban water <coughs> plan for projected, projected pumping. If there's an anticipation of, I, I think, innovation and things like that that will produce uh, release. Okay, two more questions. You're in the home stretch time. Why are the ASR patterns for Santa Cruz, the city of Santa Cruz, so erratic? Uh, because river flows are erratic, uh, so those are based off of projected San Lorenzo river flows, which uh, which provide the, the supply for the annual recharge or the upper storage and recovery at, at wells, and it's based off of there, there's a projection of what those river flows will be and what what is the excess river flows that are available for for the storage, and so uh, the, and the river flows are erratic, and so that supplies are. And those are connected to projected rainfalls for those years? I mean, they were all over the place. How, how can you, what, how, how do you determine those levels? Uh, so this, this is modeling that is done um, separately from, from us, but it is based off of rainfall for the historical years, um, or uh, projected rainfall for the, the, the global climate model um, future years. And so the, the modeling on the surface water side is, is based off, off of those projected rainfalls. Thank you. Why, this is the final question. Why is a model so expensive if you are using public domain software and public data? Uh, and so I, I think the, so the paying for the model software was, was free because it's public, but some of the enhancements did need to be paid for, so the US Geological Survey needed to, uh, we asked them to add certain things, and that did, uh, they needed to be paid for the time to do that. Uh, but that's not the biggest cost. The biggest cost is the consult cost to put together the model, to calibrate the model. Um, and uh, to work on the model, which was complex, and it took a lot of our time. And so uh, uh, it has uh, cost, that leads to cost. Thank you, and again, I want to thank all of you for staying a little longer. These are all very important questions, and we invite you back January 24th um, for our next meeting, and have a very happy holiday. Thank you.